a few introductory remarks because I think they're very important when we read the Bible um, to agree on. It's kind of a, a, a covenant between you and me. We have to agree on these points before we move on uh, to exploring the Gospel of Matthew. Number one, the Bible uh, uh, was not written by God. If you think God has written the Bible, then you're in the wrong class because that's not what we believe in. The Armenian church believes in the Bible as an inspired collection of writings. The word Bible comes from the Greek uh, small books, the plural of Biblos, Biblia, which means small books put together. Armenians used Asvazashunch to emphasize that these books are inspired by God and not Astvadzakir, they are not written by God. This point is very important for us before we delve into the reading of the biblical text, because we're always constantly challenged, challenged by two dominant traditions that try to make us believe that the Bible was written by God, verb by verb or letter by letter. There is a, a extreme evangelical tradition which claims that every letter was written by God, and then as well as well from the Middle East, there's the Islamic tradition, which uh, believes that the Quran was written by God and in Arabic and the Arabic dialect of the Quraysh tribe. And that's how it will be read uh, eternally. And when we go to the kingdom of Allah, that's the text. None of these uh, interpretations or uh, uh, definitions are the ones used by the Armenian church. And the proof is we say, Avedaran est Mateosi. The gospel according to Matthew. According means it belongs to Matthew. Matthew wrote it. We say, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah. So it's very important foundation for us to accept the fact that the Bible is a book uh, or a, a compilation, a, a, a collection of books written by human beings, by guide, but guided by the inspiration of God, and that's very important. God inspired people at the most appropriate moment to witness his revelation, whatever it was, and then he inspired the same people or their followers to write down this revelation. There are many verses in the Old and New Testament that says, write down, write down what you just saw for generations to come. God controlled the process of not revealing of himself, which is 100% in his control, but then of the eyewitnesses who witnessed um, the event and then those who wrote it down. In fact, there was even a process of editing. For example, the book of Chronicles, if you read it, repeats the stories of Deuteronomy. Chronicles was written after the return of Israel, Nehemiah and Ezra, and they kind of re-edited the book, updated the um, historical context and presented for the post-exile uh, Israelites. Likewise, we know, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke says it up front, there are many people who wrote before me about Jesus, and I explored them, examined them, and I did my own investigation. I wrote this Gospel to you. So we have to accept the human element in the Bible. It is a synergia, which is very important in the Orthodox understanding of redemption. God works with man for the perfect plan of creation. God voluntarily vol uh, reveals of himself, his will, his love, and he orchestrates the stage for eyewitnesses to witness it, understand it, write it, and then convey it to generations to come. This process for us is important for two reasons. Number one, the biblical revelation is infallible. It's eternal, it's perfect, it's from God. It cannot be wrong because it sources God, it's about God, and God revealed it and God controlled the process. But the historical context in which this revelation is documented is very much human. And we have to understand that. And this is where the challenge of preaching the gospel, of understanding the gospel, of teaching from the gospel or the Bible comes. The two elements, the, the divine revelation and the message from God, and then the context in which that divine revelation was documented. God is a God who loves mankind and reveals himself through 
the man's history span. It's not God of dictatorship who just sends a package like uh, James Bond and then there's a recording. They read it, that's it, it has to be done. Or God, through the history of humanity, interacted and revealed his will and his commandments. And in that process, the eyewitnesses who were human beings had to document this revelation in the context of their own uh, history, knowledge of sciences, geography, and that is very much human. The Gospels, for example, disagree with each other. In one of the Gospels says Jesus went from Jerusalem south to Galilee. Another one says Jesus went from Jerusalem north to Galilee. Obviously, RP and I and those of us who have been to uh, the Holy Land know Jerusalem is south of Galilee, it's not north of Galilee. So if the author is not very well versed with the gospel, with the geography of, of um, Jerusalem, the Holy Land, he may make this mistake, but it does not affect our salvation. Whether Jesus went south or north, east or west, what matters to me is what he preached, what he did, and what he conveyed to us as his disciples and his followers. The divine message is capsuled in historical context of human history. And to understand that message, we have to unpeel the, 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 the layers uh, that uh, form a conduit or a channel that conveys the message from generation to generation. And for this, we have to understand who the author of that specific book is, when he wrote it, context of writing it, why he wrote it. Uh, again, assuming that you agree with me that it's not God who sat down and uh, and imagined this book, then let me upload it to humanity. And then we were trying to download it. And we have, if you agree with me of the synergy of God working with man and God out of love, no other uh, pressure, just love for us and willing to save us and deliver us revealed of himself and then he also went beyond the revelation to make it uh, not time bound while rather eternal he inspired people to witness it write it edit it and make it uh, into one book called the bible why is this important for us because there are things that are timely and are historical and come with the context of the message and unless we understand that and we know why uh, the author saying this, uh, we will not be able to reach to the core of this conduit or the cable, coaxial cable, and understand the message. Uh, there are cultural things. There are scientific limitations. Uh, Ezekiel, God takes um, the prophet or the, or the angel takes the prophet and he shows them the whole creation of God, the whole world. But in those days, scientists uh, believed that the world was plain. And the Semitic language to see, to say, I saw something completely, you say, I saw the four corners. In other words, there was no corner. I didn't go to see of that, whatever it is. So the prophet says, and God showed me the four corners of the earth. You cannot take this and say Christianity. You know, little did they know that the world is you know, spherical, and it's not, it, it does not affect my faith and iota because the scientific context of the time of the writing of this document, the word was plain and there were corners. So the prophet, to express in his human words what he has experienced, which is beyond human limitations, God's appearance to him and showing him the entire creation, he had to use human words, which is, I saw the four corners of the earth. Jesus on the gospel, uh, in the gospels, when he is crucified, his final word says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if we don't understand uh, the practice of the Jews, which was to recite the first few words of a prayer as a title of the prayer, like we do, we say, let's pray to our fathers. The prayer's name is not our fathers, Dominical prayers, uh, Hair Mer. But we call it Hair Mer, our father, because its first, first few words is our father. Likewise, the Jews had the same thing, the Psalms, 
the books of the Bible, it's called Genesis because it starts with Genesis, the generations of God's creation. And likewise, uh, the prayer. So Psalm 22 is what Jesus is reading on the cross, which is a psalm that depicts miraculously the suffering of the Messiah. But at the end, it uh, demonstrates the suffering person's 100% trust in God, that God will deliver him, and that after this agony and pain, there is resurrection and there is celebration. So if we don't know this context, if you don't realize that Jesus <clears throat> is quoting from the Old Testament, excuse me, if I'm talking too fast, let me know. I'm trying to squeeze all these things before we move to, to Matthew. Uh, there was a movie when I was a teenager. I don't know if you were aware of it, but um, The Last Temptation of Christ and a Greek um, author wrote this into a fiction where Jesus last went on the cross realizes that he was wrong, that God has forsaken him. Jesus, according to the movie, really thought God will come and help him miraculously in taking him, you know, but he realizes pain is dying and he starts hallucinating and imagining things which make up the story of the movie. But obviously this uh, author of this fiction either did not know or intuition did it, did not uh, realize that Jesus was reading Psalm 22. It's important to know the context of which the author is writing this book and the characters are interacting. The Virgin Mary said, my soul shall magnify the Lord. And we all know that, but the same thing was said earlier for the mother of King Saul because she wasn't having baby and she prayed. So there's a nice echo that the author, or at least the characters are using uh, to teach us something. In other words, uh, I'm not losing faith. In fact, despite all the suffering, I know I will rise. Go and read Psalm 22. And it is these things in the Bible that makes it some, make it sometimes difficult for us to understand uh, the Bible or the message of the Bible, because some of us, again, I think, influenced by some uh, extreme, um, uh, what shall I say? I, I hate saying evangelical, they are Christian, but, you know, I, I open the book to see what God will tell me, you know, or sometimes as if the Bible is not enough, you know, well, God told me, but, you know, God's ultimate revelation is Jesus Christ. And uh, the stories of Jesus are documented in the Bible. If there's anything beyond that, God should have revealed it in Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus. So why would he then, 2000 Christ, realize, oops, let me talk to Vatuhi and tell her, you know, she has to do this. Doesn't make sense. It minimizes the greatness of the sacrifice of Jesus. Having said that, we have to also realize that neither Jesus nor God has written any of the books of the Bible. It was written by the eyewitnesses. Some people argue the Ten Commandments might have been written by God and God gave them on stones to tablets to Moses, could be. Others argue that when it was the time to stone the uh, prostitute, that Jesus wrote a few things on, on, the, on the ground. Uh, but the reality is none of them were books of the Bible. So the books of the Bible written by human beings and not by God. Initially, initially, the the narrative of the Bible um, was transmitted orally. Uh, since we're reading the Gospel of Matthew, let's dwell on the New Testament. The stories of Jesus first started circulating after his resurrection. Until his resurrection, people were disappointed, afraid, because he was accused of being a traitor. Uh, and he was crucified as a traitor of the Roman Empire. That's why they put on his cross, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, because the Jews had one king who was the emperor. He claimed, uh, I mean, they claimed he was planning a revolution and thus against the emperor and thus gets the uh, maximum penalty, which is crucifixion. But these stories started circulating first after his resurrection and the earliest stories, which became very popular, were stories of the resurrection. 
and these stories spread from community to community to community. And after that, of course, when uh, the stories of his uh, resurrection spread, people want to know who was this Jesus, when was he born, where? So the stories of the uh, infancy and the nativity uh, became popular. And of course, then his sermons and his, his preachings. This oral tradition roughly uh, is recognized as a fixed tradition. In other words, people memorize these stories from uh, community to community, from generation to generation. It is usually uh, scholarly referred to as kvel or q, which means the source. This is the beginning of the New Testament. And then it, it is believed that the first author who wrote about Jesus, who was an eyewitness and wrote down the, the witness, was the Apostle Paul. His letters go as early as 56, 57. Uh, by the end of that decade, he was condemned and taken to Rome, and his latest letter could be 63, 64. These are the datings of the letters of Paul. Mark is known as the earliest written gospel. Some scholars, especially conservatives, argue against that because in our manuscripts, usually the first gospel is Matthew, then Mark, and then Luke. But textually, when you compare uh, facts in the books, Mark seems to be uh, documented before certain events. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus prophesies about the destruction of temple, but he leaves it as a prophecy. In the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, he goes into details saying the armies will march in and the Romans will defile and all that, which led the scholars to believe that Matthew and Luke were written after Mark. In fact, about 90% of Mark is reproduced in Luke and in Matthew. So uh, since Mark is believed to be written before the destruction of the temple, because it remains just a prophecy with, with no uh, additional information, then Ma Mark must have been written before 70 AD. If that's the case, then Matthew would be 75 AD, something like that. It cannot be uh, very old because the last gospel, the gospel of John was written around 1992. Um, but there are connections between uh, these Gospels because the first documentation of the teachings of Jesus was Mark. Uh, and then the theory is that Mark had his own uh, kvel, his own local traditions of what Jesus said and did. And then he compared that with the general oral tradition and with how Mark put that oral tradition to writing. And he came up with the Gospel of Matthew, and you can't, scholars can trace how things have been modified. To give an example, Mark says, the woman went and saw the empty tomb. They were afraid, and they told nobody anything, because they were afraid. That's how chapter 16 ends, the first part. Uh, but if they told nobody, then nobody would know about the resurrection of Jesus, because the apostles were hiding. And the only witnesses were Mary and, and women with her. The fact is, when Matthew writes that, says they were afraid, but they went and told Peter. Once you say they went and told Peter, then you give a reason to explain how the message went out. Now, of course, Mark was edited, and in the ending of Mark, we read, but after that, the woman went and told Peter and the apostles. Uh, and there are other things that uh, help scholars conclude that Mark is the first uh, gospel, and then Matthew uh, was based on Mark. Um, every one of these gospels had its reason for writing, of course, its author, and when it was risen, uh, written. The timing of Matthew, as I said, usually is expected uh, accepted as 75 AD. Uh, AD. Um, who is the author of Matthew? Matit uh, Yahweh, the gift of God. Uh, in Hebrew, it's two words, Matit Yahweh. It has two T's, Matit Yahweh. That's why when we write the Hebrew, the English, where you put two T's in the uh, name, 
And that's why you do the Armenian, it would D and T, I mean, Yun and To, because the actual Hebrew word of his name is two T's, Matit Yahweh. And because the Jews would not dare to mention uh, the full name of Yahweh, it was his, believed to be his proper name, so they would actually replace the four letters, which was Yahweh, it's known as tetragrammaton, by other adjectives to imply who is implied in this sentence. They would use Hashem, the name. They would use El Shaddai, the Most High. They would use Elohim, the God. Or they'd use Adonai, Monsignor Adonai, my, my master, my master. Um, another way the Jews went around this tradition of not uh, using the name of God in vain and mentioning Yahweh is by cutting his name in half and just using Yah. It's a very interesting tradition. So when they say praise God instead of hallelujah, they would say hallelujah. A very commonly used word, hallelujah, hallelujah, because they couldn't, they wouldn't say Yahweh. It's blasphemous. So hallelujah. Or they want to say God saves Yasha Yahweh. Chillar, Yahweh Sen, Kuremen, Yasha Yah. So the prophet Isaiah, Yasha Yah. And thus, in the case of Matthew, Matit Yahweh became Matit Yah. And then Mat Yah. So Matthias, Matthias became uh, in Latin and Greek the name uh, from which came Matthew. Some uh, etymological scholars claim the, uh, the Yah of Yahweh was replaced by Theos. So Matiteo, Matthew, the name Matthew comes from that uh, combination. Who is this Matthew really? Uh, we don't know much about him. Uh, all the manuscript says, the gospel of Matthew. I am not aware of a single Matthew gospel which uh, ascribes the authorship of the first gospel to somebody else. I'm not aware of any scholar who argues that uh, Matthew is not the author. Um, there are traditions which confirm that this Matthew is the evangel, uh, the apostle Matthew. There are historians or uh, church fathers of the first century and the first century, early second century, such as Igna uh, Ignatius of Antioch and Papias, who wrote about the four evangelists, and they uh, introduced the first gospel as that of the apostle Matthew. Also, in the gospel of Matthew, we read uh, a variation of the story of the calling of the Levi, the tax collector. In Mark, it says that he called the tax collector. In Luke, it says that he called the tax collector to be his follower. In um, Matthew, as he called the tax collector, whose name was Matthew. Uh, that's a hint for us, scholars think, that the author of that gospel is Matthew himself. The others don't mention his name, uh, most probably out of respect, because being a tax collector was not a great thing in those days. Uh, the Jews would not even accept their testimony in the Sanhedrin. Uh, but Matthew, as out of humility, uh, mentions that uh, he was Matthew. So traditionally accepted, uh, we accept uh, the evangelist, uh, the, the apostle Matthew, tax collector, as the author uh, of this book. When did he write this book? Well, we, we discussed it when, but where? Where did he write this book? And who are the intended uh, audience of the Gospel of Matthew? We said it must have been mid-70s, maybe early 80s. Um, if you look at the early Christian communities, uh, Christians or the followers of Jesus, who were not called Christians, by the way, they were called Nazirim, those who follow the uh, boy from Nazareth, the Nazirim. Um, in Jerusalem, they were almost boycotted. Their businesses died. Uh, they were afraid because their rabbi, their master was crucified. So Christianity went a bit out, although there, there was an early church in Jerusalem, the Ebionites, but the tendency was to uh, Syria, Damascus, the Apostle Paul went there. 
So uh, 70s, 80s, scholars think it must have been either Jerusalem or Damascus or Syria where this book, book must have been written. It was written in Hebrew in, uh, to the Hebrews, to the Israelites. We know that uh, for many reasons. Number one, the Gospel of Matthew, unlike the other Gospels, mentions uh, practices associated with the Israelites and the Hebrew people without explaining them. He just assumes his audience know these things. While Luke, for example, was writing to uh, Theophilus, a Greek uh, Roman uh, general, uh, he feels obliged to explain some of these things. For the Jews did not do this, did not observe this, things like that. Uh, the other thing is uh, the language of, uh, of the gospel is very much uh, uh, Hebraic. There are phrases... Um, and beggingly he begged, and uh, uh, cursingly he cursed, which are Syriacs in there from the Syriac and Semitic languages uh, that entered uh, later, uh, of course, the Syriac language after all, but they come from the Semitic uh, structures. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, also in its uh, context, is one of the, uh, maybe it is the uh, mostly uh, Old Testament quoting Bible, uh, gospel. The other gospels also quote the Old Testament, but Matthew, every other phrase, he tries to uh, prove uh, what he's saying by referring to an Old Testament prophecy or a situation uh, in the Old Testament. These things led scholars to assume that the audience for which the gospel is written were Hebrews, uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, Judea, South, Israel, or maybe even further north, uh, uh, Syria. Uh, what is the intent of the book, really? What was the main kind of theological uh, issue that uh, Matthew wanted to convey? Again, knowing the situation in the 70s and 80s in the early church, the main issue that Matthew uh, wants to demonstrate to his audience, which is resonated back and forth over and over and over throughout this gospel is that Jesus, the son of Mary, is the Messiah, is the expected uh, Christos who will come to seal the final new covenant with the people of God. This is the main theme. It's repeated in many, many ways, different ways, but uh, Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, we uh, will talk about this when we start reading the Bible. But the second issue is associated with this one. Uh, Jesus uh, is the Messiah. But in that sense also, Jesus is God and is the Son of God. He comes from God uh, and he is the presence of God amongst us. Uh, so the divinity of Jesus uh, is uh, also reflected in many, many ways. But more importantly, the fact that he came from God to preach the coming rule of God, the kingdom of God. And it's very interesting, again, because we, uh, I call it static, we, we receive our faith as dogma. Sunday school teachers convey to us these facts as a blocks, almost mental blocks. We did not go through the beautiful experience of the first century Christians to actually convert to this faith because it's very important. Uh, many people knew Jesus, and for many people, Jesus did miracles. It's fine. But these people knew from their ancestors and their uh, holy books that God will send the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one of God. Matching these two was a major challenge. In fact, it's on this point that the Jews of the temple disagreed with Jesus. Because ultimately he said, yes, I am. I am the son of God. I came. I was before Abraham. And you will see the son of man in glory and all these things. So um, for us, we take it for granted. Some of us later on start questioning uh, some of us, maybe never. But uh, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, Jesus is the Son of God who came to seal the covenant 
and establish the rule of God, the reign of God. And the point here was the kingdom of God is not a place where we go. It's not a place where we live. It's not a boundaries. Give your passport, you enter. Welcome to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a state of being where God's rule runs the show. Where if you don't abide by God's rule, you're dead. Now, we live in a world which is very free. We can curse God. We can do anything we want. This is not the kingdom of God. And definitely the United States or the United Kingdom or Gharapakha uh, are not the kingdom of God. They cannot be the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where God's rule dominates. And you cannot live without that rule. Once you say no, you're dead. In the old days, when the king passed by, the subjects would bow down. Because if you raise your head to look at him, that means you challenge his authority. He'll cut your head. So when we pray, we bow down, reminding ourselves that we want to be in that state where God's rule is running our life and not the Constitution or uh, other things. That's why we pray, saying, like, Thy will be done. We want to subject our lives to your will because it is not now. It cannot be on this earth. Those of us who listen to the Jehovah Witnesses. The kingdom of God is not a place, it's not a location, it's a state of being. When God rules his creation, and when, when God reclaims his authority over his creation. Now, the kingdom of God is one of the themes of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, sometimes uses the kingdom of God, sometimes the kingdom of heaven. Again, the reason he replaces God with heaven, because the Jews do not want to use Yahweh. So it's of saying, Uranos, with you, he was Uranos, Adonai, Uranos uh, uh, of heaven. Uh, Basidia. It's of Basidia, with you, Basidia, Uranu, the kingdom of, of heavens. Another uh, theological theme, which is uh, very important in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, is the baptism of Jesus and his inauguration as in, in the baptism as uh, the Messiah. Because uh, if you look, and we're going to read it today, hopefully, the second part, uh, the baptism is staged uh, such that it's orchestrated as an enthronement. Uh, stage, the heavens open, trumpets, angels come down, there's a fireworks in the background, uh, and then the message is, he is my son, listen to him. So it's not only baptism, really, I mean, it's not only going to the water, uh, and the question is, of course, did Jesus need to be baptized? Of course not. So baptism is used by Jesus uh, to announce his mission, to announce the beginning of the end of Satan, the beginning of the kingdom of God. Uh, and that's why for, for uh, Matthew, you'll see, we can read it. It's expanded. There are some details. Uh, and the, the phrase is repeated several times. This is my son. Listen, listen to him. Um, Matthew talks about the law. He has to because he's Jewish. He's Israelite. But then verses righteousness. It's very important. Matthew doesn't go as far as Paul to say the law is obsolete now. It's gone. We have Jesus Christ. But he's almost there. Matthew says, uh, the law says this, but the law limits us. We need to go beyond the law, be righteous, uh, forgiving, loving, uh, so we can uh, be qualified of the kingdom of God. Why this? Because in the Jewish uh, practices, uh, they try to find loopholes. Uh, so, for example, it says, uh, uh, help your neighbor. If the person was three houses from their house, they'll say, well, he's not my neighbor. He's not, his house is not attached to my house. So the man can die. <laughs> They're very, uh, their conscience is very clear. He was not my neighbor, so I couldn't help him. I'm sorry. So Jesus is saying, when it says, help your neighbor, it doesn't mean physically just cross the wall or your beautiful garden, rather, you know, whoever you can reach, uh, try to help. So that's another theological issues, law of the Old Testament, 
and uh, the righteousness of man to transcend the limitations of the letter of the law. That's an important thing in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, another issue, uh, uh, let me say it. For, for Matthew, Jesus is the new Moses. It's very important. Uh, Matthew highlights the fact uh, that children were killed because of Jesus. If you know the story when Jesus was born and Herod could not locate his place of birth, uh, he decided to kill all the babies, all the infants. Uh, and because of that, thousands of children were killed and there's a detailed story about that. The same thing happened with Moses. Uh, the Pharaoh announced first the midwives to kill the babies of the Hebrew ladies who are born male. But then the midwives did not cooperate with him. So finally, at the end of the chapter we read, Pharaoh announced killing all the children of, of the uh, Hebrews. Number two, Jesus was adopted by a father. So also was Moses. Because his mother put him in a basket and threw him in the river Nile. And uh, he was adopted by the royalty. So uh, the two of them had uh, worldly fathers adopting them. Um, Moses went to the mountain to bring the testament, the Ten Commandments. Jesus went to the mountain to give the mount, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is believed to be the New Testament's Torah. New Testament um, uh, laws. Uh, and there are many things uh, like this. Moses came to deliver his people and he led them from Egypt to the promised land. Jesus came to deliver uh, his people. He took them from the land of sin and death to uh, eternity and the kingdom of God. And because of that, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, many scholars agree, was written in five parts. Uh, Matthew is imitating uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Just like Moses was uh, believed to have written the first five books, which is a, a collection of all the laws that were ever revealed by God to his people. Likewise, uh, Matthew tries to put everything Jesus taught in these five books. Uh, so the Gospel of Matthew really can be divided into five parts. They're called five discourses. Uh, and these discourses, each one of them has, has a theme. The first one is the Sermon on the Mount. The second one is the sending of the apostles out. And thus, you know, the third one is the parables. And every discourse is a long lecture that Jesus gives. And between these five discourses, uh, there are um, uh, narratives the apostle's embellishment of what the discourse is about. You may say this is too far-fetched. Well, there are uh, literary scenes that help us prove this. Every time a discourse ends, and uh, the, the evangelist says, and Jesus saw that these people you know, were inspired, whatever, and he left them. And this is this paragraph, to be exact, uh, I wrote it down here, the phrase, that is repeated over and over, uh, kind of defines the boundaries of um, the discourses. Yet Jesus lamentsuts as poskera, as mutuna apshads menats amar usutsumin vara. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at what he said. And this sentence is repeated five times, uh, ending the five discourses. Of course, as a literary genre, it has its introduction at the beginning and has uh, its end at the ending. Uh, <clears throat> the five discourses will be the outline of our course, my brothers and sisters. So the following five weeks will be the second discourse to the fifth discourse and the conclusion. Uh, the only thing left for me in the introduction before I... Uh, Leave you for questions if you have. Uh, we did the theology. Uh, that's it. 
I think for now. We spoke briefly about the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, I don't want to delve into that, but uh, you know, there's a theory that there was Oro and then uh, Mark, and then from Mark came uh, Matthew and Luke. That's why the three of them are seen as similar. Sin optics uh, viewed as uh, similar. Hama desagan avedaran. Hama desagan. They are uh, looked as similar as together. Uh, okay, let's stop here. If you have any questions about everything I said so far, uh, including the Bible, uh, how it was written, the Gospels, and then introductory remarks about Matthew, because uh, next thing will be actually reading the text of Matthew and going through these key things that we want to cover in the coming five weeks.